I'm Gifting Gope, Major League Baseball player. Please support international baseball by subscribing to CBO TV. Hello, and welcome to another exclusive interview here on CBO TV. My name is John Dunias, and with me today are four major key pieces for the Marlins staffing. If you're able to hear this story for the first time, I hope that you are amazed and as astonished as I was by the innovation, creativeness, and overall work that they did while they were working for the Miami Marlins. So with me are the participants, Charles Sano, Bray Liddell, Enrique Diaz, and Mario Signorello. Gentlemen, introduce your title to what you were then, uh, what we were called then and what you are called now. We'll start with you, Charles. Uh, thanks. Um, thanks, Moose. All right, Jonathan. Um, yeah, so I was the uh, director of group sales with the Marlins. I was with the organization for 14 years. Start off as a, uh, uh, a sales rep, um, originally doing uh, group sales for uh, schools is what I was. Quickly moved into management and took over the department for a little bit and uh, left the Marlins in 2018 after 14 amazing years. I'm currently working in uh, healthcare staffing, doing locum tenens staffing for neurosurgeons and uh, cardiothoracic surgeons. A little bit of a change, but it's uh, it's a great change. Okay, so that's what I'm doing now. Bray, uh, yeah, good afternoon, guys. Uh, so I was with the Marlins for 14 years as well. I started off as an intern in 2005. I worked my way up the ranks and uh, left a little bit before Charles did. Uh, and my last. Uh, job title there was manager of group sales. So I oversaw um, the group department and some of the activities and events that we put together. And Charles and I, uh, and as you will know, and meet Enrique, um, handled the facilitation of all the special events at the ballpark. Um, that was my role right now. Currently, I own a merchant service business, which is outside of the sports realm, mm -hmm. uh, which is a little bit unique, like Charles, uh, as a uh, not being in the particular field that we had been in for such a long period of time, but it's allowed me to have a, a lot of great time with my family. So thank you for the introduction. Okay, Enrique? Hey guys, um, well, my title there, <clears throat> I was a coordinator for groups and sales. Um, I started off as an intern in 2014, and then after my internship for that year, these guys hired me on, was there for another four years. And like Bray said, I was pretty much the the backroom guy helping making sure that these guys were hitting their goals and reaching their their potential um, and now currently i'm a licensing specialist for a medical staffing firm like charles in the healthcare industry um, so it's a lot different from what we were doing with the marlins for sure for the record he's actually my competitor right now just for the record <laughs> uh, we don't talk shop though but of course no. we kick his ass <laughs> Okay. Uh, finally, Mario. Hi, uh, Mario Signorello. I was the uh, started, actually, it was the first group salesperson they hired back in 2004 uh, with the program that I, that I had uh, written to them about uh, implementing a youth baseball and softball partnership program. Currently, I'm the CEO of the Caribbean Baseball Organization, which is, and this is part of our uh, properties is our channel today. Okay. Thank you guys for all joining me today. It's really appreciated. Now, you guys all worked with group sales. Uh, can you explain further about that, what you guys did overall? Yeah, I'll kind of start off real quick, Moose. Um, so, yeah, Jonathan, um, you know, it's funny. I'm looking at these guys right here that we went to, uh, to battle with for a while, 14-plus years. Enrique was five of those glorious years. Um, when we first started, it was, what, 2005, I think it was? Group sales was a new concept to sports. Um, you know, originally it was how do you get people to games or season ticket sales. And uh, the Marlins, amongst other teams too, I don't want to say the Marlins innovated group sales, but mm -hmm. um, the manager at the time, Marty Mulford, um, he created an apartment um, based around something, and Mario will talk about in a little bit, something Mario started, full credit to, to Mario. But uh, we started off as a, a small department that was, uh, we called ourselves the rogue department. Um, while these guys were selling season tickets and the organization was focused on individual ticket sales, back in the early 2000s or mid 2000s, group sales was a new concept. It was how do you find people to go to sporting events that weren't fans of the sport, right? Like that's a group. So you find people. 
we went from giving away free tickets to kids for summer camp to selling 21,000 plus tickets for summer camp. Uh, Mario, I'll talk about youth baseball. Yeah, it was unreal. I mean, there's some stories. I mean, I always joke, uh, the two highlights I have was Hanley Ramirez got traded. The first game he got traded, we sold out the game. (laughs) And then uh, the other game was – uh, was uh, Jose Fernandez has come back after surgery, hits the home run. It was a sellout. Was Both were camp days, so we had 20,000 kids there, uh, which was a testament to this crew here. Um, but as a whole, group sales, what we did was literally find a niche that wasn't sports and baseball related, put together a program. Uh, there are a lot of logistics that Enrique took care of most of that, um, and, and sold tickets. You know, Star Wars Night, for example. It was – I don't know, uh, start off as a few hundred people. And over the course of a few years, we were getting, you know, up to 3,000 fans that weren't necessarily Marlins fans, but they were Star Wars fans. And uh, there were a lot of, you know, we did a the theme of the ballpark, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I always take pride. Uh, a colleague of ours who's not on the call right now, Arrestus Hernandez, started a University of Miami night. And it's still down as the largest single group sales night we did. Enrique, what was the highest number we got to, Enrique? 19 and change. 19 and change. I think it might have been even 20, just might off, have been. off the record. Just to sound time. better, right? Yeah, 20 is good. Yeah, but, yeah, no, overall, better. I mean, you, you think about it, it's 19,000 people from one company coming out to a game. And uh, a lot of that was a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff, a lot of the logistics. Mm-hmm. But as a whole, I think uh, – Back in 2005, when I got hired, I was the first uh, group sales outside hire. I was in charge of schools. Actually, I met my wife. Another story for another time. Bray, I don't know you're off topic. You're our first intern. Mario actually started the department. And Enrique was actually one of our first coordinators later on. So um, that's kind of the big picture. Um, Bray, if you want to talk a little bit about your internship and how you got into it, man, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in order for me to complete my college education, we had to do a four years internship. Um, so in 2005, I applied and got a job with the Marlins. This, uh, essentially, uh, all I did was support the sales staff and the particular needs that they needed. So with that came, you know, back in the day, with, there wasn't restriction on hours, so we were working 60 to 80 hours a week. You're working a full-time uh, job, basically. Yeah, full-time job uh, with $500 a month, which is... Big money. Uh, you probably get arrested now for uh, doing something like that. I'm pretty that. sure that's illegal, but uh, continue. It is now, yeah. Most, yeah, Jonathan, yeah. Um, and then, you know, from there on, we just evolved into what Charles said. We each had a specific niche or field that we, we concentrated our efforts on. Uh, we still had a full menu ability to sell any particular type of event, but we, you know, Mario focused in on youth baseball, anything related to baseball. Charles was in the schools. Um, I did a lot of the corporate um, hospitality stuff, and uh, I was in the medical field, so I worked a lot closely with a lot of hospitals. Um, and there is just building a book of business and essentially uh, meeting people at different networking functions, uh, facilitating relationships. And then once you build upon those relationships, it leads into you know people buying from you instead of um, really putting the Marlins at the forefront, kind of what Charles said. So. We, the, the sole purpose of group sales was to create an atmosphere or an event that uh, the baseball game was the second feature and not the front feature. Um, and with that, uh, when you created that event and that activity, um, you would repeat that and evolve upon that each and every year to make that better, to add more people to that particular group. Um, so group sales is, is really not a new concept. It just was new because... Uh, just like anything now that you see in sports uh, that that's evolved as far as like the activities for any game and any event, you have to go ahead and, and one up it every single year and, and do more for the fans. So, um, and with that comes, you can target different groups and, and get them involved by adding different features to the, the game itself. So um, that's a little bit, I guess my little take on groups and where I started and where I ended up. And then, uh, I mean, maybe Enrique or I guess Mario, I don't know who wants to go next and kind of maybe Mario, you talk a little bit briefly about uh, what you did. And then uh, Enrique can talk about how he facilitated those events. (laughs) Okay, we could do that. Mario, would you like to add on to what Bray said? Uh, Sure. Uh, 
I pre predated them by about six months when the Marlins had showed up at a college baseball game that I was organizing, saw four or 500 kids run around baseball uniforms and asked how I did it. And uh, I kind of said, when you like to know, and then we kind of sat down and met. Eventually we negotiated a position for them to create for me to be the first group person. And the, the basic premise was make it a special event. Uh, now it's a lot easier for me talking to people who already go to baseball games, but we, we formed partnerships with different youth baseball leagues and we had different designated youth baseball days. And on, on, on April and May, there was a Sunday game and it wasn't a holiday. We would add anywhere from three to 9,000 people on the average uh, attributed to group baseball. After that, the six month period went, they brought in Charles and, and another member and Ray came in as the intern. And then, and then they, let's come up with other ideas. And, and the ideas that, the, you know, my niche always kind of stayed the same because as long as there's youth baseball, I've got a built in, I've, I've got built in. You, you have a, you have an area to attack. Right. But then, then, then we reinvent ourselves. Uh, Charles got on the, Charles got on the bandwagon by when he became the manager, then director, and seeing that there were other, what other teams were doing, and said, let's do a theme night for Star Wars. I didn't think much of it at the time. 3,000 people later, I was impressed by Star Wars night. Bray became <laughs> of course, be with, with you, Siggy. Bray became friends with the, with, with the uh, Boy Scouts and wanted to give that, wanted to put that on, on steroids and give that a shot. So we did things like uh, bringing the Boy Scouts in the batting cage to let them hit. And then, then we had the great idea of we're going to do a baseball game. We're going to play a baseball-themed movie after the game. Uh, parents and families would come out and sit on the – and watch on the ball field, sit on the actual field themselves on a blanket, and then they would sleep over at the stadium just to get that – more of that, that ballpark experience to, that to what's fantastic. going on. That's yeah. pretty cool. The, I, I would love the, to see that now. We evolved it into high school. We started bringing high school baseball games at Marlins Park, and they would buy anywhere from 500 to 1,000 tickets, but they would make it day games. So this way all the students would come watch them play, and we, we discounted the tickets so, so uh, way down the line that the schools would actually make money. So they're adding 500 to 1,000 people to our, game, to our games, and then the purchase price to come to a play at Marlins Park Field of Dreams was buy a ticket to opening day of the Marlins game. So we would sell out opening day, the schools would make money, and we would have crowds and, and high school kids get to build memories. And that's kind of where the whole department started to evolve is, what else can we do? And Camp Day started by, by simply me seeing that we were giving away camp tickets and me paying $9 for bowling and $11 to go to the zoo because I had a kid that was in camp and knew all we had to do was get in the rotation. Well, Charles and, and Bray took that and put it on steroids. And I think Bray had four or 5,000 tickets just from the YMCA himself. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the real interesting one was how we developed a field trip into 10,000 kids. We actually moved the major league game stating time and Charles had a guarantee we would sell 10,000 tickets mm -hmm. for, yeah. in order to get it. And the first one almost got weathered out because of smoke. But oh, we progressed yeah. on for there, and this became this became almost a standard throughout the league. So, Charles, why don't you pick up on that? Oh, weather day! Wow, it, it, it's it's now steam day, but yeah, <laughs> shit. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I'm not gonna lie; it actually was a a program the Royals started the year before. Okay. Did a lot of research and worked with the uh, Broward County School District. Uh, my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, uh, introduced me to the science uh, person over at the school district. And we create a uh, official curriculum, which is pretty cool, but around science. It was when uh, they're evolving it to meet their standards for testing, all that kind of stuff. And uh, so we had, uh, it was an official field trip day. I had to work with our uh, vice president of uh, operations who worked close to Major League Baseball. They rescheduled our game to, to one o'clock at the time and eventually evolved to noon. And uh, at about, I think the first year was almost 12,000 field trip kids signed up to go to the game well there was a fire in the everglades that night beforehand oh no yeah yeah and so if you know anything about like the school district and health and all of a sudden wow the alarms are going off and all the kids were canceling like uh twelve thousand people come into a game that we moved to you know and so i was working with both school districts because dade followed broward oh no broward followed dades because we were in dade kind of the old state at the time and, and both counties were good with the health, but we still get the sign off from the health department. So 
outside of selling tickets, all of a sudden I was now dealing with the health officials and all these other things. And long story short, everyone got approved, all hands on deck calling the schools, get out here, get out here, everything's good. Uh, so, you know, our first, our first weather day at the time was 12,000 plus kids. That's everyone was happy, healthy. It was great. I think we won actually on a walk-off. Uh, the next year, I think we won all another walk-off uh, <laughs> inside the park by Emilio Bonifacio. Uh, so it became a thing, but, you know, they're still doing it right now, this weather day, steam day thing. So it's about finding resources to come out to games that aren't baseball related. And, yeah, I mean. I and, know. The be- and the beauty of it was the, most of these kids, this is the only game they'd come yeah. to. So in order for us to get them there, in order to get them to return, they have to come for the first time. Bray, why don't you tell them what you did with benefit uh, employee benefits group Whoa. and whatever the Yankees were coming to town. And then Enrique, you can tell us what, what a Sunday looked like there, which is crazy because we all did it all, but you had to make it, you had to pull it together. But if the Yankees were playing, if anybody had ever purchased a Yankee shirt, wore an NY shirt or moved from New York, Bray knew who they were and was bringing them to the game. I think himself personally, brought over 10,000 people to some of those games. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, Bray, would you like to uh, follow up on that? Yeah, so there's, uh, you know, part of an industry that, you know, with anything else, there's a supply and demand involved with, uh, you know, with a particular set of group of teams that would come down here. And when that happened, um, I just definitely capitalized on that by working with different uh, secondary market buyers uh, Bray, uh, your your mic seems to be e- echoing out. Can you repeat that statement? We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So with certain teams that would come in from a particular area, we would – can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay. We would uh, capitalize on that because of the type of people that were down here from the Northeast. So with that being said, those games would be a higher ticket uh, as far as like a need or you know, want to watch. And I targeted um, different groups that we, we would sell tickets to that would then resell the tickets to these groups at a higher rate. So, um, but we would leverage these tickets with other games. So it wouldn't just be for them to come in that one particular game. So we would have, you know, as far as a, a team standpoint, we would have these tickets already sold and then they would actually create their own market for the, you know, for the, for the game that was coming up. So you know, I targeted specific uh, companies and groups that, that really wanted to capitalize on these teams coming in. And with that being said, in turn, you know, really brought, uh, I guess, brought a lot of stress off the organization by unloading tickets uh, in a, a quicker manner. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so it's, it was a supply and demand situation. Like he said, Entertainment Benefits Group was one of our, one of our largest groups that would purchase, you know, upwards to 500, 600 tickets at one point uh, to one particular game and then just subset those out to different groups that would look to purchase them. So um, that was a whole different market that we attacked and uh, strategically attacked towards the end of our tenure um, based upon, um, you know, not flooding out the market. So, Okay, that sounds great. Enrique, you know, with all the information that was already given to us from the special – uh, theme days to everything else. What would you like to say about you know group sales and everything else that was mentioned before? Sure. So, like I said earlier, I started as the intern um, in 2014 with four other interns. I wasn't designated solely to group sales, um, but for some reason I got picked to handle that camp day. Uh, I guess I did a good job, and these guys entrusted me with yep. you know, handling all their all these things. So, like you know, between Star Wars. Um, all these events, uh, high school baseball games and things like that, where these guys were the ones selling, I was the one making sure that these groups were getting their tickets, um, knowing where to go when they arrived and, and all the logistics behind it. Um, and, so and not only that, you would say you were group. like, you would say you were the backbone of the group. He was the glue. Much. I was the glue where I would. I would be the one talking to marketing, to operations, um, for whatever imagery we needed, for any uh, activations we needed for any special event, for camp day. I was the one working with the weather channel for weather day and the school districts. Um, now, mind you, these guys had already like 10 years jump on me uh, mm-hmm. because they've been doing it. But 
a lot of the things, for instance, like Bray, who was talking about entertainment benefits group. Well, I'm sure when that started, it was all hard tickets. Later on, groups like that became all digital. Mm. So we had to develop working with our ticketing team, working with our marketing team to develop, you know, web pages on the Marlin site for those groups. You know, they could, you know, visit our websites and purchase from there as a big group, a company of 300 plus people. You know, they wouldn't have, they had their specialized URL. Mm -hmm. So I was the one kind of working with the in-house departments to get those set up for these guys. Um, you know, going back to Mario with his youth baseball in high school um, games, those, those events were fun in and of themselves because, you know, these little kids, all they did was play baseball. All they wanted to do was play baseball. So then getting them to the game to watch the Martins play, that was awesome. Um, but those Sunday games were, you know, with the parade, pregame parade of, of 1,000, 2,000 kids walking the warning track and everything. It, it was operationally challenging. Uh, challenging. Uh, it, it was, well, on a, you know, on a busy Sunday. Su Go ahead. On a busy Sunday, this is Mario again, but on a busy Sunday, we might have sold the, some, uh, a large group would throw out the first pitch. Uh, we had another member that would sell that would sell to uh, high school bands. So we might have a high school marching band of 300 going out to center field to perform the national anthem. We also might have a cheer group that's going on. If there, was the dogs. Ex, if there was a ball player from my South Florida area playing in there, then Bray would have found out who his family was and made a group to that family <laughs> and sold them a suite. So you don't yep. forget dogs, Park of the Park, too. Got dogs. Uh, my, my, yeah. mom my mom loved that idea. I love it. So, so yeah, like Siggy was saying how, you know, you had one group doing anthem, another group doing a first pitch, all these different pregame activations. I was the one kind of like making sure that all those people were there and all those groups were there. Um, but yeah, it, it was, it, it, it was a very challenging, but very rewarding, you know, kind of seeing those people. I remember I helped Bray once uh, with this guy who was proposing pregame that Dude, that was awesome. Like, that was, that, amazing. That was getting every department involved to Question. make sure that, that she wasn't, didn't have a clue of what's happening. Okay. Uh, By the yeah, way, it, did, it, did she say yes? Uh, yeah. Okay. okay, thank God. And for the record, she had no clue what was happening. Okay. Like, you see, you see future proposals. I think they might know. Bray and Enrique pulled off the ultimate, yeah. ultimate proposal. No idea. Yeah. I, I, I cried. I'm not going to lie to you. I cried. <laughs> no, for real, I did. I was tucked away in the office, but I cried. That's awesome. Okay. So, going, but yeah, like, just to finish off, you know, these guys were, you know, challenged to make sure that, you know, to get the people there. And once they were there, I was the one to make sure that they had a good time, you know. That, that's awesome. And I'm glad that you're able to do such a great job with all these events that these guys set up and everything. So, great job on all four of you guys' parts. Now, with the South, uh, South Florida market, what were some of the challenges that you guys faced and what was needed to be done to be successful? Whew. Challenges. Uh, challenges. I, I, guess, um, I guess one of the first no, ones is the Marlins not being a really good team. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, yeah. I mean, at the time, you know, we were there, what, as, as a crew, and Ricky came a little bit later, but we were there, what, oh, like, and Ricky were oh, 04, but oh, 05 to 18. So it was a, a good run. They um, traded the even, entire team. They traded the entire team three times while we were there. Yeah, <laughs> and even when the team. So I, it's actually a true story. So 2006, when we were at the old stadium over at Joe Robbie Pro Player Dolphin, whatever you call it. I don't know who was with me. Went to Sublicious. It was September. We're at one and a half. We're one and a half games of the wild card with a bunch of rookies, and the guys like, "You guys suck. You guys suck." Right? I'm like. I mean, we're like a game and a half of the playoffs. It's 06, we're all rookies. <laughs> and um, it just showed that, you know, I'm born and raised in South Florida, right? So I grew up in, in North Miami. Um, I've been working in sports since high school. I worked for the Marlins in high school, worked in college. Um, it just shows that the, the biggest challenge is our fan base being a new organization, in my opinion, wasn't very educated on baseball economics, is what I always said. Because um, the Marlins always have to trade guys who can afford them. But if you do the research on baseball economics, there's a whole formula behind it. You either can pay up front and do it, 
or you trade guys right before they're ready to make the money and get pro- – like, it's, it's a formula. The Marlins were unfortunately, you know, economically challenged. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in my opinion, the challenge be- was educating fans about baseball economics. You can't convince somebody – in my opinion, you can't convince somebody if they have an opinion – you're not going to change it. So I think what we had to do was enhance the experience. If you don't like what management did or front office did, that's one opinion. But come out to a game with your kids. And, you know, when I left the Marlins in 2019, even before I left, I bought season tickets. Why? Because I truly believe in the experience. You know, I, got, I bought nine season tickets, my family. I've had so many amazing experiences now as a fan with my kids going on the field and youth baseball recognition. And I brought out the American flag for the anthem, all those things. Congrats. If we win or lose, thanks. Awesome. By the way, awesome. <laughs> Doesn't matter if we win or lose. It was a cool Saturday night with my family. And that it new was, stadium is a fantastic stadium. It was amazing. And now they have a lot more stuff going on. So they got a beer garden things. I mean, hopefully next year we can get to a game. But overall, we had to come up with reasons to go to a game. That was not about winning and losing because you can't predict baseball. I mean, who would have thought the Marlins right now would be five and one of the best teams of baseball after everything? I, on, I, right? Actually, I think what, they're seven and one because we won the doubleheader yesterday. Whatever it is, um, I just you know at the end of the day, like we had to come up with experiences. So the challenges we had was the media, it was the people talking, um, it was just it was just. I don't know, stupid. I call it stupid stuff. But at the end of the day, you go to a baseball game, you're going to have fun. And that's what we as a group sales were able to try and do. So I don't know if I'm going to open up to you guys, Bray and Siggy and, and, and Enrique. But that's my opinion. I'm sticking with it. My job. So we, we, we reinvented the wheel in a lot of, in a lot of times uh, with, in order to get people into games. We, we, we did a multitude of different theme nights across there. I mean, I remember Charles every year had a, had a night in September. Uh, September Jewish Heritage Night that would that would draw in the thousands and thousands of people to be able to go to games. I mean, Bray, Bray, Bray and me one year did over a million dollars uh, worth of business worth of business, and it's by hustling in it. And it, we stood through the the good and the bad times. We saw trading the team three times. You you've got a different part, but it never stopped our drive and how we went about our business. And, and we've, we've all moved on to different things, but we all are very supportive. Charles is a season ticket holder. I frequently work, uh, work the games, and I've been in some conversations with the Marlins. And, and Bray, Bray's, got, uh, Bray's got two little ones, so he gets there whenever, whenever he can. So we, we're all supportive of what, of what Derek Jeter's doing and think that th- this path what is, going to lead, is going to lead to, uh, to a, a real solid place for the Marlins year in and year out. Not not up and down as much as as we used to do it, but we're very proud of the work that we were able to achieve. Okay, uh, Enrique Bray, who, do you guys want to add up on that? Yeah, I mean, biggest challenge is, is education. Um, we're a team that had uh, was doomed from the beginning when uh, they sold the team the the day after they won the World Series. So there was already a black eye or black mark on the organization, and we were consistently fighting that that issue. Um, you know, interest people down here are, are very transient, so they're not they're you know you don't have the generational fans as you do in different markets. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is, is, you know, when you draw, you don't draw most, most teams draw on a full circumference. They have East, West, North, and South. Well, you know, East you're in the ocean and West you're in the Everglades. So, you know, traveling to the actual game. So I didn't know where you were. I didn't know where you were. So I'm like, no, we're all looking at you. So, you know, do you mind me and you stuff for me? Yeah, so traveling to the games were a challenge. So, um, you know, because it was hard to get in and out. Um, So you really had to kind of, you know, really be strategic on what you were trying to do, on what what night you were trying to put your activities, because you wanted to make sure that you were cognizant of, you know, you could do a – particular type of event during the week which you could do in a different market because there would be no way for the people to actually get to the game okay enrique so yeah um like what mario kind of alluded to earlier with like the passover or the jewish heritage you know we became very as an organization i think we became very creative in, in tapping into the local groups that were already here you know, doing heritage nights for the, you know, the different Latin groups, either Puerto Rican, Dominican, Colombian, um, Nicaraguan, all these heritage nights. 
Um, so we, we, we kind of pinpointed little niche groups. You know, Bray had a lot of different uh, awareness nights where it was focused on different groups uh, with either a, loop, a lupus or there was other different, you know, different things that we, we, we could tap into, you know, that, that would raise funds for the groups themselves because we developed something called fundraising with the fish. Um, you know, where, where we had to become, we had to go outside the norm of just getting people, you know, to the baseball game because of the lack of either generational um, fans or real competitive, you know, competitive. Miami is a very transient, you know, fan base, like, like Bray said. So we had to develop these different strategies to get people, you know, having wrestling night, uh, Star Wars night, Star okay. Trek night, you know, these groups, we, we, you know, we developed them and we nurtured them throughout the years where they became, you know, larger than normal groups. Okay. Now, I guess the final question is, would be, what advice would you give to someone wanting to be in sports, in sports sales? I guess we'll start with you. first. Yeah. Me? Oh, yeah. boy. I'll I'm the worst it. expert. Yeah, Bray, take that one because I'm the worst okay, example. Okay, we'll, we'll start with you, I'm, I'm too passionate. Okay. Yeah, so you know, you're going to have some balance. The, right now, it's, I'd be, it's very difficult because you don't know what the, the sports landscape is going to be, right, you know, mm -hmm. for the future. So that's the number one thing is you have to evaluate what position that you're going to be able to take. Um, you know, maybe it's something that's in broadcasting, you know, because that's a little bit more secure because the game is still going on now. Those people are still having jobs. Um, but let's just, take, let's just take this COVID situation out of the, the picture. Um, you know, advice I would take to get into getting into sports is really going to be, um, you know, find what area you're passionate about and then just take an internship and then, you know, work with other departments and see if that's something that you actually really want to do, you know, because you don't really know what you're going to get into until you're actually kind of like you, what you're doing with your internship, but it's, you, you have to put your feet, I get your feet wet and then you got to find out, Hey, what's, what's something that's what you're going to be passionate about, um, you know? And so you sometimes you fall into that and then you start liking it before you do it. Um, but you know, um, okay. it's really just kind of just this one I just you know, taking time. Okay. Uh so Norella, would you what type of advice would you give to someone that's uh, going to sports sales? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I, I said like, you know, what type of advice would you give to someone that wants to go into sports sales? Uh, it, it's the quickest way into any organization is the best thing that I can, is the best thing that I can tell you. Mm -hmm. The, uh, and, and just make sure that it's what you want to do and that, that, that it's your passion, that it's your passion and just give it your all. You never know where, where things can lead you. Brian Chatton, the general manager of the Miami Marlins right now, uh, right now started out as a salesperson and that was his toe in the door. And then, then he, he went in, then he got a entry level position in baseball operations and he's worked his way up. Okay. Gotcha. Enrique, uh, same question. Uh -huh. What advice would you give to someone that wants to go into sports sales? Hold on, uh, real fast, Enrique. Uh, I yep. don't mean to cut you short. I apologize. I wanted to thank you for this interview today. Um, it was great to talk a little bit about some of the history behind the Marlins, uh, what we did. Uh, unfortunately, I have to attend to something. So, uh, best of luck. Thank you very much. Love you, Ladao. Thank you. All right, Brady. G Squad. Good to see you. Okay. So, Enrique. Uh, yes. So, same question. Like, what advice would you give to someone that wants to go into sports sales? Sure. So, uh, I wouldn't say it'd be for just sports sales specifically. I would say just in sports in general. Mm -hmm. um, don't be afraid to start at the bottom, and you're gonna have to work hard, regardless of it's in sales, marketing broadcasting, whatever aspect of sports, you're going to have to, you know, start at the bottom. You're going to see how everything works from the inside out, um, you know, and, and and like Siggy said, you got to work hard and then don't lose a little bit of that sense of entitlement, um, you know, because if you're in sales, you know, you got to prove to these individuals that they're going to be spending their discretionary income on going to a baseball game. You have to, you know, Put yourself in their shoes to kind of and especially now in this market with with the uncertainty of everything um you know 
it's going to be challenging, but you know, if you put all 100% effort and, and be humble, I think, I think anyone could su to be successful in sports. That's great. Now, saving the best for last, Charles, same question um, for you. I don't know about best, but as someone who did uh, hundreds of interviews, um, you know, I, I look back at myself, right? I'm the worst example of someone who wants to work at sports, right? So I was the South Florida guy who didn't want to leave, only wanted to work for three teams. I worked for UM to start my career. I worked for the Marlins. The other team, I was the Heat. And uh, I applied for a job there, and they just canceled it. So uh, <laughs> from a sports industry, I'm the worst example of how to do it. But with that being said, though, for someone who wanted to work in sports, whether new or moving from another uh, industry into sports, it's about branding yourself. You know, I look, you know, LinkedIn right now is a huge thing. You know, how do you, how do you stand out about someone else? Um, yeah, the sports industry doesn't pay well, but I will tell you the best, what, I 14, 14 years at the Marlins, three at UM is what, 17 plus, I worked four years in college, so that's what, 17, 21 years plus two years in high school with the Marlins, so that's uh, 23 years working in sports. Mm -hmm. Probably the best 23 professional years of my life. Not to knock my new job, but there was really good jobs, really good stories behind that. But great relationships, a lot of cool things I went through. Um, at the end of the day, though, if someone wants to get in the sports industry, it's really about branding yourself. You know, LinkedIn, you know, don't be stupid on Facebook and, and Twitter. You know, I had interviews be, be with guys. With your, be smart with your choices. 100%. And I think, you know, especially with, uh, especially with uh, I guess you could say, younger or less experienced people, you know, sometimes, like, yeah, if you're hiring for a job, I will Google you. I will go to Facebook. I will go to Twitter. And if I see something stupid, I don't want to do the drama. I dealt with enough drama with Mario, Enrique, and Bray. And these are the best professionals I ever had in my life. It's just normal day to drama, no offense, Enrique and Mario. <laughs> um, but I don't have to hire somebody that has these – even if it's not drama, I don't want to see that kind of this stuff. This extra baggage is what you're trying to yeah, say. Yeah, like, you know, I mean, and I get it. Social media, you know, that's the problem with social media now. Uh, you know, people want to be outspoken, but sometimes that's not a professional – like so i would say one um be smart on social media okay. to brand yourself like linkedin that's the best way to brand yourself okay you know um if you're applying for a job go through some linkedin training ask for advice um people are more than welcome to help you hit me up um with some linkedin how to better your profile and, and do that kind of stuff uh you can find me at charles Sand on linkedin mm -hmm. um at the end of the day though like this industry is one of the most amazing experiences you'll ever have. Uh, it's That's definitely something for uh, someone with flexibility with time. I mean, there's a lot of time and effort that goes into it. Mm -hmm. When I was in high school, um, I did an internship with, uh, at the time, Joe Robbie Stadium, dating myself, but Hard Rock, whatever it's called now. The Marlins Stadium in 97, my senior year. And the HR guy at the stadium said, listen, man, if you like – a lot of amazing experiences for low pay and low pay and lots of hours. It's a great job. And I said, yes, I do. And an unbelievable career. Uh, wouldn't trade it for the world. Um, met amazing people, the relationships, you know, between Mario and Enrique. And I got to go shout out to, you know, there's so many people with the Marlins that helped us, you know, between marketing with Juan Martinez and mm -hmm. Rafael Davila and Sergio and Mariah um, operation with Antonio and Anthony and all these guys out there. I mean, you, you and Angela and Alfie and you just, you grow a relationship over the years in sports, like a team. Um, uh, it's very fulfilling, but yeah, you got to put in the effort. It's, it's a grind. I mean, now that I'm in uh locum tenant staffing, love the job, but it's a different type of grind. It's not 18 hours a day sweating, waking up after four hours of sleep with blood clots and pulmonary embolisms and the flu and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I can see you doing that, but you're on the video doing that. So it doesn't really help the, the whole thing. Let me text that by the way. Okay. So it's also babysitting your team and making sure everything works out smoothly. So with that said, apparently this means get going, right Sigs? A little bit. Yes. I was trying to, but yeah. I know, but, but Siggy actually did on the camera, so I'm going to call him out right now. It's making <laughs> sure that your staff doesn't do anything stupid on camera. <laughs> I love you, Siggy. Okay. Anyway. Okay. But gentlemen, and to all He told me you can go like an hour, so I don't know.
gentlemen and, and Bray, who had to leave a little early, thank you guys for joining me this evening and being a part of the interview. Uh, we, we all do appreciate it, and I do hope that you guys have success in your own endeavors. Uh, to the viewers that are watching, please like and subscribe. It does help us out a lot. And thank you for everything. And hope Hit the like, subscribe. Thank you guys thank very you. much.